And your last name is Ruzich. Is that how you pronounce Ruz it? Yeah, Ruzich, which means a little rose. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Okay, we're live on YouTube. Joe, do you want to start us live on Zoom too? Okay, and the people will start pouring in. So we'll give everybody a few minutes to get in. So Milan, in the meantime, you want to entertain with some owl calls? Okay, well, yeah, that was part of the deal. Yeah, required. Okay, so um, first I'll go with the one which is not um, so familiar for you guys in the States. That will be the Skopsal. It's one of my favorites. It's, it's a typical summer call in, in this region. And, uh, and the Skopsal call would be something like. <whistles> and they're really funny because usually they would be calling in, in, in duets, in, in couples. And sometimes the male or female would be more high pitched than the other call, and they would go like. Okay. Um, any more wishes? Well, you have to do long eared owl. Okay. I told you I'm not really um, good with a female call. It's bit tougher but a male call is really simple and and anyone can can do it it's 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 a simple hood it goes like <clears throat> and if if a male is on a on a lookout for a female he will be flying around and possibly doing some wind clapping and then you can hear the sound like <clears throat> So you can easily imitate and, and actually you can attract a, a male to come over to you. Maybe you can you know, even make a picture during the evening if you're kind of in a, in a park or walking down the alleys and because, you know, they're breeding in, inside human settlements as well. Um, begging call? Uh, well, yeah, the, the, the begging call of juveniles is something like, <clears throat> excuse me. It's a bit different, yeah, but, but you can you can actually imitate that, that as well, and you can hear the, the ju juvies come calling from almost uh, a mile away, or even even, yeah. Wow. During the cold night, you can you can easily hear them from really really far away, and then you can walk and find them. They would be usually disperse on, on several trees around. Um, when they're big enough, they will be branching and going down the trees, coming up, and usually there will be three four of them different branches, different trees, and then, you know, of course, the mommy and daddy will be quite busy trying to get enough food during the night. Any other owls that you can do? Uh, <clears throat> well, you know, all different ranges of scops owls, but because <laughs> they're quite quite similar, but um, let's try an, uh, an eagle owl one. Yeah, well, eagle owl is, is, is the big thing, as, as you know, and, and they would be doing something like... <laughs> That's why they call it uhu in German, and we call it bulina, or um, yeah, because it has really rough and, uh, and strong sound. Um, what else? Well, uh, hissing barn owl. I mean, Ooh, if you, yeah, yeah, they 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 do, they're doing something like That's fantastic. Yeah, you can hear that during the night, uh, especially if uh, if you're looking out for nests, and if there are juveniles inside the nest, they, they will be calling and and uh, hissing to each other. That was one of the best calls I've heard. Gosh, uh, encore, encore. I can do a raven as well, but that's not the topic tonight. So let's save it for the next time. Okay, can you do any kind of little owl calls? <laughs> Okay. Okay. Do you want to get started with your presentation? <clears throat> Absolutely. All right. I'll do a little intro first. So a little background. I, I know most of the people joining us have seen some of our presentations before. So just a little bit about the International Owl Center. We are located in a town of less than a thousand people in southeastern Minnesota.
<clears throat> excuse me, southeastern Minnesota. And we're here because we evolved here, not because we said, oh, this is a great place for an international owl center. It just gradually developed um, from Alice the Great Horned Owl. If you hear an owl hooting in the background, that's Alice. She shouldn't be as vocal as previously because she laid a couple eggs this last week. So she's now busy sitting on eggs and is quieter. Um, so we, as COVID kind of closed the world down and we had to be closed down for um, three months and then open for a while with limited admission and then closed again, came up with the idea of doing this virtual owl expert speaker series because you know, our goal is to educate people around the world. And uh, I'm blessed enough to know all kinds of fantastic owl people from around the world. And Milan is one that um, I met in 2007 at the World Owl Conference in the Netherlands and had some time to spend with him. Um, so we decided to get folks together and say, hey, would you do a presentation about your work so that the rest of us can all be learning from what they're doing? Because um, for some of the presenters, most of their work may be published in other languages, um, so it might not be as accessible. Um, and so many of us who are educators or rehabilitators might have not have easy access to this. So we decided, hey, let's do this. Let's make it free uh, so everybody can participate. And it's, it's been a very big success, a great way for training our staff at the OWL Center. So we're enjoying this as much as everybody else is. And very much appreciate all of you that are donating to support this series because there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes to make it work, uh, but your donations make it absolutely worthwhile to do. So a few housekeeping notes. If you're watching us in Zoom, the chat is disabled. Um, we just want you to ask questions in the Q&A section and we will save the questions until the end of the presentation. And we almost never get through, I think only once have we ever gotten through all the questions. So just be aware that, that we'll pick and choose questions to ask Milan. Um, and we very likely won't have time for all of them. If you are watching us in YouTube, the chat there is enabled, uh, but be aware that that chat will be saved with the video um, and archived with it so people can watch it later. So do keep the chat on topic there. Um, and we do have some chat room moderators that'll help over there. And they will shoot some questions from YouTube over into the Zoom Q&A, and, but, but we do give the Zoom questions higher priority than the YouTube ones since we can't get to them all anyway. Um, and this presentation doesn't have a specific sponsor other than all of you who generously donated when you registered for this presentation. So we very much thank you for that because that is what makes this happen and makes it work. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Milan Ruzic from Serbia, who I met in the Netherlands in 2007. He is the CEO of BirdLife Serbia. He started studying long-eared owl roosts and monitoring them in 2004, and he's written or co-authored more than 100 scientific papers and co-authored four books. So, he's who you're here to see, so let's turn it over to Milan. Thank you very much for doing this for us. Hello. Everyone, okay, just give me a second. Um, okay, let's share the screen. All fine, good. Okay, um, well, it's about um, 8 p.m. here in Serbia at the moment. I know it's about 1 or 2 p.m. in the States, wherever you, you guys are. Um, are watching and well, and also from the rest of the world. And uh, tonight or today, I will be speaking about uh, a really special town and and and, a, and an owl species that had have, have, have shaped my life a lot. And so let's start. Of course, these four guys on the on the picture are long-eared owls. Um, one morning, they just went out of of their usual hide and for some sunbaiting. And our friend, uh, Chad Davuchkovic has, has taken this lovely picture that we often use in our presentations. So um, more or less this story would be uh, dealing with two different species. The, the species number one is the long-eared owl and uh, species number two is a human being that's um, connected with owls or, and that will be me and my friends. And you can see a nice long-eared owl on the on the left slide, and and my friend Dimitri Radishich on the on the lower uh, right position. 
So uh, let's have a look at, um, at the owl diversity in my country. Well, Serbia is situated in southeastern Europe, um, more or less between the central Europe and the Mediterranean zone. And it's quite diverse in different habitats. We have um, extensive lowlands up in the north of the country and they're uh, steppic kind of uh, with large rivers and riverine forests. And, and then further you go south in, uh, in, into the country, you run into hillsides and then further south, you go up to the mountains and some of the habitats are, are almost uh, alpine-like. And these 10 owl species are living in Serbia. So from the right, uh, sorry, from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, of course, the largest one is the Eurasian eagle owl then Ural owl, then Tony owl. Number four would be the short-eared owl. Number five is a, is a real star, the long-eared owl, then the barn owl, little owl, tengmals owl, scops owl, and Eurasian pygmy owl. So on, on, in, in the upper position, there are uh, adults and, um, and lower would be juveniles of these species. And this lovely poster was done by uh, two friends from Poland. And we use this a lot, especially for the educational purposes. I think we printed over 6,000 copies of this poster and, and, and people are still looking for it. And so why do we speak about long-eared owl today? What's so special about this species? Well, long-eared owl is not the largest species of all, not in my country, not around the world as well. And in this picture, you can see an eagle owl, which is much bigger and, and more powerful. And there are many bigger species. So it's not about the size. And, and if, of course, it's not the most aggressive. It's, it's not like this, this beautiful Ural owl that we encountered on, on Vršac hills in, uh, in northern Serbia. And these species can be really tough. You know, If you run into a female that's uh, protecting the brood, you can be attacked, you can be hurt. And that's not really the case with a long year now. It's also quite common within the range. So it's not a rare species and which you would have to travel to look for and go to special areas and look in the, in, into special habitats to, to get one. So they will be living around us, at least in this, in this part of the world. But uh, there's something else uh, special about, about this bird. Okay. Uh, this is, um, these are the pictures from one of the roosts in Serbia, uh, taken roughly about seven, eight years ago. And you can see all different faces of, of different birds. I mean, they could be really funny. You know? Sometimes they look serious, sometimes they look um, uh, sleepy, sometimes they look uh, angry at you, but more, more, more or less, you know, they really do change faces, just like we humans do. And so how did it all start it? Well, this is the picture from, I believe, from uh, the fall 2004, November. Okay, so thanks to my friend, this very, very special lady called Tanya Jovanovic, um, I got in contact with uh, long-eared owl phenomena. And uh, Tanya was actually studying long-eared owl pellets for her uh, master thesis here in Serbia and Belgrade. And uh, she published some, some of the results. And after that, she got in contact with, uh, with a few Serbian ornithologists. And she said, well, um, I've been collecting pellets around the country and, and there, there are a few nice roosts. How about if you go and do first ever uh, monitoring and first ever survey of uh, long-eared owl roosts because it was never done systematically before. And then she contacted me many other people and among them me as well. And so this is how it started. Uh, Tanya is also a, 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 um, a person of art and a good friend. And we had some really good time. And uh, on this slide, that's me, but a long time ago, uh, here in Novi Sad, where I live at the moment, we were visiting uh, the only known long year roost within the, within the city. Unfortunately, only a couple of years after um, these two trees uh, disappeared because they renovated this building and they cut down the trees. Then the owls moved to another location. And on the right hand side, there's Tina Tepovats. Um, uh, by that time, she was a student. She was also helping research, helping the survey. And she's 
at this moment counting some of the owls up in, in trees. And you can see that they're actually, uh, in both of these pictures, and owls are uh, being found on conifer trees. And there's a clear reason why. We'll, we'll speak about this a bit later. Okay, um, this is a picture also from uh, an area close to Novi Sad. Uh, funny enough, uh, the picture was taken in one, uh, one of the uh, police um, station yards. And you can see uh, loads of long-eared owls actually sitting up in, uh, in birch trees. And as far as I, as I can count uh, on this picture, there are over 50 of them just in this one yard. And there should be more of them around as well. So this was actually keeping our attention because we found out that in some of the locations, there could be quite a big numbers of owls. For example, look up this picture. Uh, okay, you can you can guess or you can see actually many owls up in the tree, but now you get to know that actually there, there are quite a few of them, um, at least 20, let's say, on, on this picture. And uh, these are some of the pictures from 2004. Uh, there are many uh, of my friends who are still active, uh, still birding, good ornithologists, people always engage with different monitoring schemes and helping in the field. And uh, Tanya uh, gave us a good reason to, uh, to start um, cooperating on, on different levels and collecting data. And it, then it uh, grew into something much, much bigger. Tanya has left the country uh, soon after, after this uh, uh, initial research. And then we had no one to lead uh, the research here in Serbia. Then some of us, me and, and, and Marko Stiban and Dimitri Radišić and other friends, we said, okay, let's take it over and, 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 uh, and, and continue doing monitoring. And so this is uh, Marko Jankovic, me and Dimitri back in 2007. Um, we got sponsored by, by um, a company from Serbia that helped us to, to start monitoring. That's uh, Dimitrius car that he uh, actually uh, loaned from his father. No, none of us has, had our own car at the moment and we always had to struggle you know, to go to the field and, uh, and, and to travel around and check all of these villages and in the area. But yeah, we were heavily helped by our friends and family. Uh, and this is how it looked like. Um, we visited many of, uh, of villages and towns, in, especially in the region of Vojvodina, which is in northern Serbia. It's about uh, the size of the area is about 22,000 uh, square kilometers. Um, the largest city in the area is Novi Sad, with about 350,000 inhabitants. And there are roughly about 400 different villages and towns also in the area. So it's quite populated. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, of different uh, settlements in the area, and 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 we would have to go to all of these different places, and, and most of them we never went before to look for owls. And thinking about thinking about back in in two thousand seven, um, people were not really fond of us walking in their little village and looking for owls because. Uh, uh, in that time, people in Serbia still did believe about uh, different superstitious things. Uh, we even had cases of people shooting at owls, uh, cutting trees down, trying to um, get rid of them, uh, disturbing them all the time. And, uh, and we made really strong decision among our, our group that we want to go into the media, do loads of publicity and stop this nonsense because uh, we knew that owls are bringing huge um, benefit to human society as well. So we, in, in, during that winter, so from November 2007 until the um, uh, February 2008, we visited almost 400 different settlements and I'll show you the results now. Okay, so this is the map of Northern Serbia of the Vojvodina province. And this is how it looked like at the end. So the red dots are actually showing uh, sites where we did find long-eared owl roosts. Of course, the size of the, of the dot uh, shows the, the size of the roost. And then these little blue dots show places where we couldn't find any roosts, which does not necessarily mean that th there were no owls, but we just couldn't find them. And then the pink dots showed that we were there just too late, because in some of the roosts, you come there in January and February, and you find loads of fresh pellets, but the owls are gone. 
for an unknown reason. Maybe they change locations. Maybe they just uh, move to couples and start breeding. But you know, that, that, that's for further studying, definitely. And believe it or not, we counted twenty-four thousand long-eared owls in about sixty days of, of, of proper field work. Yeah, that's that's quite a lot. I'll tell a little bit more about about numbers as we go on. So 26,000 owls in this, uh, let's say, not really huge region, um, showed us that uh, there's plenty of food for them, which can actually support uh, such a big population. And this is uh, Dimitri and me now in, back in 2010. And so we continued doing monitoring. We couldn't find enough uh, support to monitor every single roost in every single village and town. So we selected a number of roosts and, uh, and, uh, in towns and villages where we could go on every, let's say, twice a month, on, on every uh, two weeks, and count all the owls and see uh, if there's any change within the roost, if, if there's any disturbance, any shooting, anything. And in two or three um, years' time, we could see really positive change of local communities around the region towards the owls. And media have played major role. And thanks to media, we then we um, could reach almost anyone uh, in the country. So uh, the major questions which, which people ask us, you know, students and locals and, and, and media people is why are they, these dolls coming into villages and towns? You know, why shouldn't they go into the, let's say, nature, into the wilderness, into the wild? Well, um, one of the reasons could be the shelter. This is village of Bashait, which is just south of Kikinda, and you can see owls really smart positioning themselves against the local uh, primary school building. And this is helping them, you know, in this region, which is completely flat uh, with really little trees, um, they couldn't find good shelter. And this is why they sometimes come and, and sit against the building, which is actually preventing wind. And winds in this region are strong, uh, winters are cold, and this is helping birds <clears throat> to save some energy and to survive. As well, I mean, the whole region of Northern Serbia and Serbia in general is, uh, is an agricultural region and uh, not too intensive in many areas in terms of agriculture and there's still food, uh, good food resources around. And this is a typical alfalfa alpha field um, where you can find literally thousands and millions of, of, of different rodents, which they prey upon. And of course, you know, if, if owls are coming into our uh, towns and villages, there's a tiny little chance that a gosok would be coming in. And we know from a couple of sites that uh, if a gosok finds um, a long-eared owl roost, it would be coming every single day until it kills almost all of them because they, they make just a, a, such a simple play for it, a prey for these species. And also another species uh, such as eagle owl would, would not be coming into the um, towns and villages looking for long-eared owls. So, you know, uh, towns and villages could mean safety as well. And now let's go and have a look at Kikinda, okay? So this is the aerial or the satellite image of Kikinda, which is a town uh, right up north in, uh, in, the, in the north of Serbia, in Banat region. And all of these little uh, polygons that you see around are actually agriculture fields. Not much of the of the of the area is, is consisted of uh, grasslands of natural habitat. And if you look at this slide, you wouldn't see much forest. You wouldn't see much woods anyway. So uh, the whole of the of the town is just surrounded by vast agriculture areas. Some 200 years ago, let's say most of this area would be not really plowed, but would be kind of uh, meadows and, and pastures for uh, people would be gr uh, grazing their cattle and sheep and different domestic animals. But these days, almost everything is turned into arable land and people are growing uh, maize and, and wheat and barley and uh, sunflower and sugar beet and many different, many different um, things. Okay, now we go down to Kikinda, and what we can see now actually is a huge change, you know, around the town, there's not much, let's say, green areas, but actually when you go to the town, the town itself, itself looks more woody than the surrounding, and this, this could actually give us 
uh, a couple of thoughts uh, what's actually going on. So if, you, if we go down a little bit more, you can see how a, a, a town square looks like. It's full of trees. You'll find big uh, buildings, you'll, you'll find houses around, but it's, there's a good proportion of trees or green areas which are inhabited by different wildlife. You know, the wildlife they can actually, that can actually stand to human presence and everything that we do inside, inside our, our villages and towns, this, that wildlife would be present in Kikinda as well. So now let's have a look at how the, uh, the Kikinda square looks like. Okay, so you see uh, at, at the back, that's the National uh, Museum of Kikinda, quite a big building. And in the front, there's a um, Serbian Orthodox Church. And all around, you can see lots of green areas. And actually that's the, that's the area where um, Longyearbyen Roost in Kikinda is situated. This is how a national museum look look like. Uh, well, Kikinda is a typical uh, mid-European uh, German or Austro-Hungarian built town. Um, some of the ar architecture is well preserved. Um, it's quite a beautiful area actually to come anytime during the year. The year, and but of course, especially during the winter, when we're um, if we speak about the Alps. And not only the owls make it uh, so special in Kikinda. For example, this is the replica of, um, of step mammoth that was um, uh, dug in Kikinda, uh, let's say, almost 30 years ago <clears throat> under a huge lay a layer of, uh, of uh, clay and sand. So um, some uh, thousands of years ago, uh, these huge animals were actually wandering in, in this area. And this animal that used to, uh, to be a female, at least scientists do believe that, uh, fell into one of the, of the um, uh, ditches and it was left there, it died, and then the bones were preserved. So the real bones are actually situated in, inside the museum, but these, these are the replica bones for people when they come to Kikinda, of course, to look. And before we found this owl spectacle, it was believed that the mammoth was the main guy, you know, but it was the main thing in the town. Then we, of course, ruined some of the uh, ideas of local tourist board and of the, of the local mayor. And then we showed them that there's also something alive and even more interesting in the town. This is the building that, um, facade of the building that sits right behind uh, the National Museum in Kekinda. It's believed that this building was, was built in 1892. And right up on the facade of this building, you can see six owls looking, well, at least to me, quite look like long-eared owls. And one of the questions that people ask us is, um, well, for how long are these owls actually being there in Kikinda? And no one can tell you that because there are no written records and no photography you know, records from 100 years ago or something. But at least we do know that someone really smart has put long-eared owls on the facade of a building right in the center of a town where owls are sitting even today. So this could give us a little clue that maybe 120 and something years ago, these guys were also present in Kikinda and someone was fascinated by, by owls. And so that's why they were put on the, on the facade of this building. And when you walk through Kikinda, you know, there's no chance you wouldn't see a huge amount of whitewash of their droppings and pellets around. And, you know, in some of the towns, People are complaining because um, you know birds are ruining their their pathways and their benches, and you know you may get little of this white and black stuff on your hat, on your shoulder, or whatever. But um, people of Kikinda are really special people. You know they found out that this owl spectacle is so special, so different than anything else in in the town, and around the town, and anywhere in the world. They they simply do not complain. And that's really cool because, you know, in if you go to Rome, people will be complaining because, you know, there are two million starlings flying around and, and, you know, leaving some stuff behind. And you go to different places and people do complain of pigeons and whatever, but you go to Kikinda and people simply love them. And, you know, and people don't complain. For me, that was, that was really good news. And, um, just going back a couple of years before, when I first walked inside a, inside Kikinda in 2006 with a couple of my friends, we had our binoculars around our necks and we were walking and just in kind of five minutes time, two police officers came and they said, what are you doing here? 
And we said, well, we came here to count owls. And they said, you don't have any guns with you? No, I don't know, just binoculars. Um, why would people, people walk with binoculars and having no guns with them? You know, that was a question. I, I was kind of shocked. And then I learned that people are just not used to bird watchers. You know, there was no one coming into Kikinda to watch any birds. And people knew that there are loads of owls around, but, you know, they take it for granted. They just walk around there, have a look at the, at the owl and, you know, go to your home or go to your work or to bakery, whatever. But there was no one actually coming with their binoculars to watch owls. No one with, you know, powerful cameras, big lenses, whatever. And when we explained them that this is something really special, they went like, oh my God, you know, we never thought of anyone coming to Kikinda and watching owls. So that was them. And today, if you try to walk through Kikinda, you would be stopped by a dozen of people that want to show you the best wary tree in the town with you know, biggest number of owls that you know, the people are so proud. It's so special. And uh, the attitude of local community becoming really locally proud of what they have has changed dramatically over, let's say, 10 plus years time. And this is a typical view if you if you go to Kikinda, and there would be, let's say, hundreds of pairs of these lovely looking black and, and orange eyes looking down at you saying, welcome, you know, this is my town as well. So wildlife is welcome here. We are not threatened by humans. And then you get another look and, and you look up in one of these trees around the church and then you see not one, not two, not three, not five, but maybe sometimes over 20, 30. And the biggest record in one tree in Kikin, there was 145 owls. It was November, 2009. And, and we were there and we counted 145 longer dolls from just one tree. And we said, okay, how about if you can't calculate, you know, the body mass of these owls in a tree? And we found out there were about 33 kilos of longer dolls in one tree. Which, that's about, what, 70, 75 pounds? That's quite a lot, you know. Um, and, you know, then we went into local media and said, you guys, you know what, you know, um, you do have loads of owls, but the number that we actually counted today is just ridiculous. It was 743 owls in a single location in just one day. And that was the world record uh, then. It's, it, it is still a world record today. And I, I, I don't personally believe that anyone can break this record unless, you know, they, you put some owls artificially up in trees. But, you know, naturally, I don't think so. And so, but... I'm speaking about owls a lot, you know, but what are what about the other species? You know, we at the beginning of this presentation we had an owl and a human that likes owls. Okay, so let's see what goes on. Okay, so that's me. Um, on the left side, I was about 25, and on the right hand side, that's me a couple of years after with, with loads of kilos that I gained. Uh, unfortunately, but still I'm, I'm quite of well, you know, attached to these species and there, there's a really uh, big story behind, behind it. Okay, so um, when Tanya left Serbia, me and my friends have, as I said, taken over the, the, the monitoring, the research, and then we, through working with, with the long year our monitoring, we we actually met so many good people, we made so many new friends. I even went to the World Owl Conference in uh, 2007 in Netherlands, in Groningen. It's really hard to pronounce this, this, um, this city's name, Groningen, yeah. And I met Carla, I met dozens of good people there, and I was so inspired by what people are doing, actually, for the sake of all and nature conservation around the world. And, uh, and it inspired me so well that I came back to, to Serbia and I said, okay, uh, we, we are just on the right track. The things that we want to do here um, actually, there are people around the world doing the same, you know, giving the best they can, um, trying to engage communities and companies and media and academia and, you know, university professors and students and volunteers, whatever we, we can do whatever we want if we have a good, uh, good system, if we know uh, what our goals are. And then uh, we invited loads of our friends and even family and everyone else uh, to join us. Um, 
I had uh, my presentation about our first owl monitoring then in Slovenia in one of the students' conference. Uh, it was uh, a really good conference. And, and the fact is that I met my current wife on this conference. So, you know, this is how it influenced my personal life in the other direction. So she's from Serbia, but I would probably never meet her in my life if I didn't go to the student conference in another country to present our work on long year dial. So, you know, there's always long year dial behind it. And, and you know, this is me and, uh, and a group of kindergarten kids from Bashait, that's a village I already mentioned. And this is the, uh, the teacher from the kindergarten. And the, the fact is, you know, we're counting owls in this village and their kindergarten is just 20 meters away across the road. And the lady came out and said, you know, what are you doing? We said, we're counting owls. And she said, I've never seen a live owl. And I said, okay, at this moment, there are 325 owls around your head. So would you mind if we take kids out and show them around in the village and show them owls? And they were all shocked because you wouldn't believe, but in many areas, people are living you know, they're walking below the owls and they never look up. You know, people don't pay enough attention to wildlife and that's really a shame. So from that day on, I think these kids became instant bird watchers and nature lovers. And, you know, they were like, oh my God, you know, the, the Harry Potter came to my village, you know, they brought all the owls. So, so that's one of the stories. And then on the left-hand side, it's my little daughter and she was just about one year old and, we even gave uh, her name Sophia, and which comes out, of course, of Greek, Al, yeah, you, you know, the wisdom, and uh, and you know, she's she she's now in Kent encountered the first ever long-eared owl in her life that I actually netted and and ringed on that day, and in the in the upper right picture, there's our friends from the BBC. The BBC came also to film. Uh, in Kikin, and they made a really nice piece about Kikin owls. And on, on the on the bottom right, there's a group of uh, British and Spanish bird watchers that came to Kikin. Of course, there's David Lindo. There's there's my true brother, uh, a, a person who has helped our work here a lot. He has helped us to promote the whole thing, and and you know these long eared owls have brought him to us as well. So this is why this is how we connected each other. So not to mention that. Uh, all the good things that we got from owls, but we have to give something back to them. Of course, yeah, there's our friend Urosh climbing up the tree and putting some of the wicker basket. And there's a wicker basket a couple of months after uh, with some longer owl chicks in. We also placed literally hundreds of different uh, sizes and different designs of uh, nest boxes. And they've taken nest, bo nest boxes since then readily. You know, we couldn't believe that they would be going inside boxes like this, but it, it's proven out that in this region, Owls are lacking good good quality uh, nests and good quality trees, so they will they will be taking uh, also nest uh, boxes that are made for uh, red-footed falcons or common kestrels. And now we do have a monitoring scheme that actually every year we go and check these nests. And uh, for all of these pictures are, are taken in Rusanda, one of the favorite spots. And uh, a little curiosity: um, there's a 10-acre park in this. Um, in this village and in this 10 acre park, we have up to 95 breeding pairs of different raptors. So we have up to 48 breeding pairs of common kestrels, up to 23 breeding pairs of long-eared owls, four breeding pairs of little owls, uh, up to 16 breeding pairs of, uh, of uh, red-footed falcons and one breeding pair of, uh, of barn owl in 10 acres of parkland. And this parkland is surrounded by village, by alkaline lake and by vast agriculture and, uh, and grazing area. So it's literally so much food around that sometimes you do find long-eared owl breeding in a, in a root nest only half a meter away from the common kestrel and they never fight because there's so much food around and, and their ag 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 aggressivity and aggression is so low that they, you know, they don't care. And, uh, you know, you, you, you could literally find long-eared owl nests on only 10 meters away from each other, all of them brooding and having chicks and you know. So this is really, really special. And that's the area quite close to, to Kikinda as well. 
So by working so much with people in, in Kikinda, you know, we achieved to, to meet some really cool people from local media, uh, people from schools, from the National Museum, from City Council, from every institution you can think of. Uh, now we have good friends with, with local artists, you know, people who make who make lovely clay owls and different designs and colors and shapes. And, and, and after some time, City Council of Kikinta and the Tourist Board have came up into a, to an idea to have a, an owl festival. So the whole month of November is dedicated to owls. And so much dedicated that there's no other place in the world where people officially change the number of month. So it's not called November anymore, but in Kikinda they call it Sovember. So instead of N, they've placed an S in front because Sova in Serbian means an owl. So the whole month in Kikinda is now called Sovember. Every, every single ch child, you know, from the kindergarten, primary, secondary school, students, whoever, you know, everyone in the town is engaged in a way, you know, people have their shows, uh, kids are doing drawings, they're doing uh, plays and, and they're making cookies uh, with, with owls and, and mice and pellets looking like things. They're doing um, handmade uh, crafts of any sort you can think of and everybody's engaged. And, and they're so proud of this that, you know, they're the only town in, in, in the whole of the country that changed the name of the month that they have own wildlife festival, that every child is engaged. And you can think how this, this is looking like in, 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 our, in the eyes of different, of other people living in Serbia. And when we talk to other local communities, we always say, you know, there's nothing impossible. Just look what people in Kikinda have achieved, you know, and these guys are so good. They're so efficient that they, that they brought this uh, owl thing to the very high profile. And, and whatever you think, they can do, you know, we didn't put that much uh, energy into, into the festival in Kikita. We just gave them a couple of ideas and just let them do their own thing. And this is perfect, you know, because they've done a lovely job. And since then, we had so many different festivals. We even had, uh, had one day thing last year during the, during the COVID-19 just outside, you know, because we felt so bad. If we stopped doing it for just one year, you know, I would personally myself feel, you know, kind of betraying kicking that betraying owls. So we just went there with, with, with media, we counted owls, and every time we count owls, they call us and we, you know, present these results to local media and they publish it. And, and then, you know, central media from Belgrade and they publish it. And we get literally millions of people talking about how many owls are kicking that are in kicking that today, which is superb. And I mentioned David Linder. He has helped us so much. You know, he has published many, many good pieces in different news and different magazines. And since 2010, uh, we had also the first ever Long Eared Owl uh, International Conference in Kikin. So all the major Long Eared Owl scientists were there. We were presenting our work to each other, uh, trying to establish a worldwide monitoring scheme for the species. So loads of loads, loads, loads what was happening around. And uh, um, I was witness, by, you know, several times of, of international TV crews coming to Kikinda. And suddenly, you know, living in Serbia um, in the past was really tough, you know, because we had some real travels in the Balkans. And, and my country was personally not always well listed up in, in media. You know, people talking about different stuff, but, you know, Kikinda and this owl spectacle, spectacle has helped us a lot to raise, either, raise up the profile of the country and to show people around the world that there's something else uh, so they can, you know, come and look for. Not only the, you know, the, the good vibes of uh, cafes and bars in Belgrade and food around the country, but also there's wildlife. And with, with the owl spectacle, uh, people start coming to Serbia and by now, David, me and a couple of other friends, we had thousands of people coming into the country, which actually opened quite a lot of other doors for the ecotourism, for, for people who are doing wildlife photography and, uh, and you know, simply bird watching. And then we could see even people uh, coming, you know, for different uh, features like, okay, so we've seen the birds, what about butterflies, you know? Well, we've seen butterflies. What about snakes? And what else do you have in this country? And then, you know, things are developing slowly, but they do develop. And, and this is also helping 
our work, as I'm working with the with an NGO, with a bird life partner in Serbia, a lot because you know gaining attention that wildlife and nature should be protected is helping our work on an everyday basis. And for example, we believe that finally a group of Americans would be coming um, to kick in as well. You can see the the advert for the January next year, and we're expecting a big group of of uh, Americans coming to kick in. Of course, we'll be showing them loads of different stuff. There's a sunrise birding company that offers the, the tour. The tours tour was supposed to, to to happen this January, but of course, you know, you know, because of the COVID-19, that not much of that would be possible at the moment. So that's why it's it's a little bit postponed. And um, well, I have the the last slide for you guys. Um, Sorry, because it's it wasn't a uh, full 60 minutes, it's only 45 minutes, but I think I was efficient. And if you did, didn't get uh, all the data that you wanted, you can, of course, uh, ask any question. And at the end, I would just say, please, um, uh, welcome to Serbia, visit my country, uh, spend some time with us, uh, come for the hours, come for the good, good people, come, come for the good laugh, come for the good beer, good food, and let's have fun. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Milan. Um, that was even more inspiring than I thought it was going to be. I guess you get better with age, Milan. Oh, you think? Yeah, you must. Um, so we have some questions coming in. So just a reminder to type your questions in the Q&A. Um, and if you're in YouTube, we can get those funneled over into to those of us who are here in Zoom. Um, so if you want to stop screen sharing, then everybody can see you big and better. There we go. And Joe and I will take turns asking you questions. Joe, are you ready to start out with a question? Sure. Um, a pretty simple one. How does your organization raise money? Okay. Oh, well, we are a typical organization that uh, gets most of the other funding from different international projects. So we are working with, with the BirdLife International, which is the largest nature conservation network in the world. And we have loads of partners in the uh, in the region and also around the world. So most of the money is coming from, let's say, EU, so European Union funds and different uh, private donors that and, and uh, foundations that work in Europe. So the thing is that we get less and less funding from the governmental bodies uh, in recent years, and that's no good news. Um, back to the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned your friends who were helping you out at the beginning. Are they um, doing it as a hobby or is birding their profession? Uh, Dimitri Radisic is working as a, as a teaching professor at Novi Sad University. So from those first pictures, uh, he grew up, he finished, he, he finished his PhD, he's now teaching students, which is really good news. Marcos Chiban is working with me here in the organization. The other Marco Janković, he's working for the LPO, BirdLife Partner in France, and the other people are still around. So some of them are working as professional ornithologists and conservationists. Some of them are um, having that as a, as a hobby still, yeah. Uh, are you concerned with the change in agricultural practices slowly coming to Serbia from other countries? Exactly, that's a really good question. Um, and thanks for asking. Well, the other countries in Eastern Europe has witnessed similar change, you know, with money coming in with big subsidies for agriculture, people are using more fertilizers, more chemistry, you know, and more spraying with it within the fields. And it, it, it would eventually drop down the, the, the populations of prey of different rodents. And that, that could influence also the, uh, the long year now. At, at the time being, we are living in a region which is the most deforestated region in Europe. You know, in some of the areas of Vojvodina province, there's less than 1% of the forest coverage. So most of the area has just been plowed. It's just agricultural land. So for us at the, at the moment, we have a big struggle with, with local and central and provincial governments to make them plant more trees and to have different tree grooves in different areas of the countryside and tree um, you know, alleys along the roads and along the canals so we can actually support the wildlife. So at the moment, there's uh, the problem with food and with poisoning is, is far less than the problem with, with the habitat. Uh, when do the long-eared owls start breeding? 
Well, a good question. Uh, well, with the, with the climate change and with something going on around here, um, the things have changed. You know, 20 years ago, if, if anyone would, would ask me, I would say, you know, in beginning of March, they would start displaying and calling, looking for a nest. And the first legs would be late in late March, beginning of April, and it would be normal. But in the last 10 years, we get more and more chicks in November, December, January. So there's loads of records of winter breeding of long-haired owls here because sometimes they breed twice a year, which is really old. Yep. And similar to the barn owl that in Europe breeds at any time, at any place, if there's food, uh, you know, enough food around. So uh, most of them, yeah, they would be breeding in from March, April and May, let's say, but sometimes they would do second brood in August, September, and sometimes even 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 deep into the winter. So the question is, I mean, the answer is not really straightforward, but you know, most of them in the spring, but some of them around uh, around the clock. And to kind of piggyback off of that, um, one person asks, "Are the owls just there in winter? Where do they go in the summer?" It's another good question. Okay, so most of the owls in our roost we believe to be coming locally because uh, in some of the roosts we did we did spend hundreds of working hours netting, netting and bringing, bending them, and only in one of once or twice we found owls coming from different countries. You know, it could be true as well that not many people are actually working with long-eared owls in countries north of Serbia, so that's why we we couldn't catch many of the ring bended ones. But, you know, um, our local populations are so dense. So if you have a central village and, and, a, and a 300 strong population of longer owls uh, wintering, most of them would be from that village and from some wooded areas around, if there are any wooded areas. And then um, from late uh, April, uh, sorry, from the, uh, um, late February and onwards, they would, be, they would start departing. They would be separated in couples and slowly they move into different green areas within the village or a town. And you can still see them. And a typical good year uh, for breeding means that you're coming into the village and in one, one night you can find like 10 breeding pairs of long owls with chicks, chicks easily. Um, this kind of plays into that when you mentioned you've been ringing the birds or banding them. Um, have you looked at mate, fidel mate and site fidelity across years with the banding? Yeah, um, they, they have quite a, quite a lot of site fidelity. I mean, most of the chicks uh, that we um, netted after uh, their place of birth were only up to 10, 15 kilometers away from the place where they were print or banded. And adults, they're known to come to more or less the same area. But the problem is, um, the problem is actually the species, you know, they, they quite well learn that once you net them, it's really hard to net them again, you know, so you may be catching them once or twice, and then third time, that's, you know, not really possible, not really easy. That's why since uh, 2009, we used bategial tags or ring tags, and, and we try to, to see what, what's going on with, with their population this way. So you put a bategial tag and, you know, you don't have to catch them again. And it also proved that they're quite local, quite, um, they have quite big site fidelity, yeah. Do you want to explain what a patagial tag is for those who aren't familiar? Okay, so uh, for many of the raptor species around the world, uh, things like white-tailed eagle or red kite, and I mean, I'm speaking about Europe mostly, and, and different different species of walters, people are using actually plastic of, of different sorts uh, and shapes and sizes and colors tags that they're actually put on the wing, on the, uh, on the uh, outer um, side of the wing. And, and, you know, animals are not really hurt because, you know, the, you have to clap um, actually to, to attach the, uh, the particular tag to the skin and it, it sits above the, the feathers. And so if, if, if the bird is actually sitting on a tree or flying, there's a big chance you can see the patagial tag. The tag has a special character, let's say one letter, one or two numbers or whatever. And you can see it from far away, you can take picture and then actually you can track the bird down. Um, and that's especially good if you have a species like owls, if you put any plastic rings, plastic bands on them, 
not much you can see because of the legs, of course, because they're, they're covered in, in, in feathers. So bategel tags are, are good. And we had our friends, uh, friend uh, Bart, um, sorry, um, uh, Jan Bol, yeah, from Netherlands. He came here to, to Serbia to teach us how he's actually using bategel tags. And then we started uh, to work here on our own. And we didn't uh, put any potential tags in, 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 in recent years because simply we're lacking enough time for that, but it's proven out to be efficient. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of reproductive set success of the long-eared owls in Kikinda. Uh, what's the survival rate for the young and where do they go since there's so many already in the town? <laughs> Yeah, well, the thing is, you know, uh, the owls are long-eared owls and not really long-living creatures. I think the longevity record in Europe is something like 19 years, but that's really odd. Um, you know, the, the oldest birds that you can actually run into are up, up to four, five, six years old because these guys are having trouble. You know, they get easily killed within the traffic um, you know, they get caught by other uh, different different other animals. Sometimes they hit into the windows in, in villages and towns, so they, they get hurt, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, you, we wouldn't expect that they would be living for too long. And um, in, in Rusanda, in that 10-acre park, we uh, did monitor, monitoring of every single nest. And in, in a good year, the success rate is about 70%. Of their nests and and the, on, on average they would produce a little bit around a little bit above three chicks per per, per nest that would fledge so that means that let's say we have 23 nests and then let's say 16 15 16 of that would be successful times three chicks that would be that means 45 chicks during the first winter plus all the adults and when you combine that you you easily get to around 100 and something birds within that little park and this is actually the number of birds that you get but the thing is as as we all know you know the raptors have the first winter is you know is usually the toughest one so the survival rate until the next spring is something that we cannot really calculate at the moment and we believe that at least half of the chicks would, would be dying off because they're not really good in hunting not really efficient and then you know the, the next spring you know would bring new um, uh, new birds into the population, and they would start breeding and actually, you know, filling in the gaps from the from the from from, from the lost adults uh, from previous years. So more or less, I think we believe the population is, is stable, and we can see huge um, uh, changes in their numbers in, in different roosts from year to year. And it, I think they're fully dependent on the on the amount of food in. Um, in the in the environment for example one year we were monitoring that 10 acre park and we had zero chicks produced in a whole year because the the, the season was really bad while the common kestrels would would be breeding and they could produce some chicks simply because they could switch to lizards but there were no rodents around so you get from 23 breeding pairs let's say 15 16 70 17 producing chicks to zero in just next season because there's clearly lack of food in the aerial map um, there wasn't much that showed water resources so where do owls find water how much water do they need how are they attached to that Got it. Yeah, that's another good question. That's a big lake in Kikinda itself, so they could go there. Kikinda is, is actually one of the one of the rare towns in, in Serbia which which doesn't doesn't have a, a real river around, but there are canals around, and there are small uh, small places with water around. I mean, that, this that couldn't be seen well from the aerial map, but there's a there's a lake. There are canals around, so I think that that's fine. And we know that owls are not drinking that much water anyway themselves because the most of the water that they, they need for their body is actually coming from yeah from their prey so if they need to drink they could go to to these areas so given all of the uh reproduction that they do um how much uh how much falling from the trees do you see of of young ones and uh, what happens with them? Is there a wildlife rehabber in the area? That's another good question. Okay, so let's say 10 years ago, we would get, let's say, five, six, ten calls a day from different parts of the country saying, we have a chick. 
long well we have a baby owl chick on the on the ground that usually means it's a longer owl especially if you're like in, in a village or a town and then it took us some time to teach people that if the chick is fine just put it up in the tree and do nothing else and then but you know most of the people love owls and they're so protective against anything around they would say no it's better if i take it home you know put it in a box i'm gonna try to to feed it whatever and that's bad news because you know people are usually wrong with what they offer as a food for these chicks and and sometimes it does happen that three weeks after they call us and say well you know we took a chick we fed it with this kind of, with pork whatever and suddenly it doesn't look really well then we get really angry with these people because we offer our service and our help and our texts and you know little films that we produce for the for the mass media saying why the hell did you take you know the chick to home you, you couldn't simply call us and do something the other thing if they find a chick which is obviously hurt, damaged in a way, you know, attacked by a cat or a dog, whatever, they can call the local Nature Conservation Institute from Novi Sad, and they have a wildlife rescue team that could eventually come the same or the next day to the location. Or if we have someone from our society as a member or volunteer in the region, they could go to, to these people, talk to them, help them, and then the animal would go into one of the two rehab centers. We have only two of them in the, in the country officially, and both of them are situated in, in big zoos, and they have a special section in the zoo where people are actually, actually rehabilitating wildlife. So owls are among the top birds that are coming to rehab centers, especially long-eared owls in spring. Long-eared owls and common kestrels, that's like 80% of the birds that go there, yeah. Um, so this person has a few questions sandwiched together. How much does a long-eared owl weigh? Um, and difference in plumage of male versus female? And what do they eat? Okay, so on average, male weighs from uh, 215 to up to 245 grams, at least in Serbia, while the females are 250 grams and plus, sometimes 300 grams. You know, that's a weight of a, of a feral pigeon. And people, you know, when you talk to people, they say, oh, I saw an owl, it's a huge one, you know. Well, you know, owls are not, they're really light and uh, and they have less than 300 grams on average. So that's one thing. The other thing, um, with our race of, uh, the nominal race of long-eared owls, at least in this part of the world, most of, of the time you can tell male apart from a female. Because not by the size, because the relative size in nature, you know, is something you wouldn't see straight away. But it's the color, you know, because the male would usually have paler face, would has would, would have paler chest and belly, you know, the, the trousers, so the, the feathers on their on, on, on male legs would be kind of cream white colors, while the little female could go into really buff reddish color. And uh, streaks on the on, on the chest and on the belly with females are really white and black and dark, while, while male male has light colors and and you know so not so wide strikes and the thing is when you see a really light male you know sometimes we caught males like this and we will it take also the blood uh, for the blood sampling and you know, to test our theory about sexing males and females but we also tested some of the blood parasites it's proven out that the more blood parasites the bird has it's it has less weight and less melanin in the body. So they tend to be really light colors. And also the call of this male is really soft and it usually means he's not going to get mated. You know, the females would not go for a male who has so much blood parasites, so light in colors, which means that, you know, it has, so dependence on, on the color of the, of the animal is, is also, you know, uh, well correlated with the, with the amount of blood parasites. Um, and, and the female knows this because she is listening to the call, to the deepness of the call, and also to the color. And most of these males probably wouldn't make it the next winter. Wow. And the last part, could you talk about their diet and what they're diet. Yeah, well, yeah, well, Tanya Ivanovic, which I mentioned several times, has done a huge extensive study on the long owl diet. And I would say, you know, long owls have really boring diet. You know, they would go for a 20 to 30 grams rodent, and that's, you know, all. If, if in a region they can find Microtus cervalis, which is a field wow in this, in this part of the world that would be the main prey, and maybe 
yellow neck mouse, wood mouse, you know, that's additional prey. Sometimes, but that's really strange, or you would find a uh, house sparrow or great tit, whatever, you know, species you can find around, not many shrews, not many, you know, not much else. Well, if you if you test, if you look for for the barn owl diet in the same region, you easily go for 15, 16 different species of mammals. Well, the, you know, the, the long-eared owl will go for two, three or four of them. So, you know, they, they, they're specialized in hunting small size rodents, I would say that. And if they don't have this kind of, uh, kind of the, uh, uh, prey items around enough, you know, they would not be breeding or they would have to switch to different prey. And then it means they're not fully efficient. You know, the hundred grams of a bird gives a lot less energy than 100 grams of a rodent. And you know, you know that. And so that's why they're going for rodents. One of our very earliest questions was about that, one of the first pictures you put up with all the different faces of the different uh, owls. And they said, I'm struck by how different the long ears can look from each other, uh, at least in their faces and heads. Is there any hint that these might represent different subspecies? Uh, as the differences seem to possibly hint at a different different skull shapes. Nope. Um, I think those are just two or three different individuals sitting up in the same tree. So a photographer was just sitting below the tree and looking at them for some time, taking pictures and then and then picking up the you know the funny ones and putting them in in, in just one frame. And and this is what happens, you know, I think that there's no better place in the world to come and see an owl from real close, like here in Serbia, from some, you know, sometimes you get an owl sitting up in a tree almost with, with your arm reach, and they're completely used to humans. And, and if you if you just stand there, you know, behave well, not use any, don't use any flashlights and things, you can actually see their changes, you, your, their faces changing. You know, sometimes they're kind of um, stretching their legs, their wings, you know, taking their pellets out and they're doing, you know, things. So this this is why, this is why you can see different, if, uh, if another animal is, is actually another owl within the same roost is producing any funny sounds because of a cat walking by or uh, they get disturbed by humans for some reason, they can start chittering to each other. And they do this really funny call and suddenly you see, all the owls doing this is like, what's going on? What's going on? You know, where's the, you know, where's the trouble coming from? And you know, they then they settle down. Or for example, if you flush, and that's bad news, if you flush an owl from tree one, they would readily go to tree number two. So from place A to place B, and they would jump into into another another um, cover, and then you can see other owls saying, "This is my tree. Go back to your place. You're not welcome here." You know, sometimes if you have enough time coming to a roost, you can see individual owls sitting on the same tree, on the same branch, on the same piece of branch for over 90 days. And they have their really tiny favorite spot. And this is what we also witnessed with the short-eared owls because roughly about 13, 14 years ago, we start witnessing short-eared owls coming also in, in, into our villages and towns, roosting up high up in conifer trees in the middle of town square, which is, yeah, you would say not really, yeah, not really common to see. And these guys do completely the same. You know, they're sitting every single day, every time on the same tree, same branch, same piece of branch. And I think they were asking about specifically about the face shape. Um, and can you talk a little bit about how mobile their their faces are? Yeah, for example, in that picture with, with many owl faces, when when a long-eared owl is, is is relaxed, you can their faces face is rounded and their eyes are mostly closed, you know, and their ear tufts are, are down. That means you know I'm kind of sleepy, I'm resting. That's fine. If they get alerted, well, if they if they're not alerted, if they hear a sound or something, they go a bit more upward position and their face go go a bit more, you know, and then they lift their ear tufts a little bit. But if they get really alerted, they go slim. You know, and they look as twice as longer than they usually look, but they look really slim. So the, the face changes every time. It really depends on what they do. If they're, for example, calling, you know, that me, male is producing that lovely sound and, you know, his neck is has different shape and you can see a little, little, little bit of white 
feathers from below, and you know, so so that's 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 pretty nice. If you have enough time to observe them during the daytime, you can see all different um, attitudes of, of an owl. There's just so many questions to go through. It's fun. Um, you talked a little bit about owls. Um, do the owls move to other trees to nest? You, you had talked about that a little bit for so, so the roosting trees are different than the nesting trees or are some of the roost trees also used for nesting? Okay, in, uh, in most of the areas that we monitor um, since the beginning, well, let's say the mid August, you see first owls that start roosting. That will be usually local breeding pair with their chicks. And they traditionally go to the same place, to the same tree, to the same whatever place in the village or, or in the town, or sometimes we do find them outside of any settlements, but usually they're in, in the settlements. And the thing is, yeah, then in August, you find only up to 10 of them, let's say, in September. In September, newcomers are coming in. And the place where they come to, we call, we call it the mothership. So that's kind of the, the center of the roost. That would be one or two trees that look like, you know, the stronghold, the main trees. And if you want to protect these species, you have to protect these trees because they're really, you know, special. And then throughout September, they start molting. So below the trees, you find loads of, you know, feathers. And in the beginning of October, you, you, you come there and you see 25, 30, 40 of them. And then from, from late October and over, it's number, numbers are building up really strongly. And sometimes, you know, you go there and they're over 500, 400, 300, whatever. And, but the, the birds that, you, that, that actually start coming in November and December, uh, we, we, we observe uh, that they're more frightened of humans, which means that most of them would be probably coming from an area which is outside of human settlements. And they're not really used to people walking there with their children and, and dogs and you know talking loudly and whatever. So they, they get easily disturbed. And then they settle down through throughout the winter and by, let's say, late January, beginning of February, all of them are fine. But you can clearly see uh, birds at the edge of the roost, which are the newcomers that come later on, they would be more disturbed to humans than the one in the center of the roost. And this is, you know, there's something going on with them and, and they must be talking to each other saying, oh, that's, that's okay. You know, it's kids playing basketball below, that's fine. They won't be shooting at you. So just keep calm. No, 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 I want to go away. Look at them, they're too big and, you know, I'm scared. No, no, that's fine. They, that's fine, yeah. Let's plant your mice around, just take it easy, yeah. You had a couple pictures of baby owls on your shoulder. What are the, what's the story behind those pictures? Well, yeah, those, you you go, you go to this uh, 10 acre park in, in Rusanda uh, in the nature park and, and you literally pick up baby long eared owls uh, just, just being there below the tree. We ring them. I just put several of them on my shoulder, have a picture and just put them uh, up in the tree and that's all. You know, that's, that was just seconds before we actually um, gave them back to their parents. You know, what's, what's also funny is that, you know, we know individual nests and we know their families. And sometimes if you go there in like mid-May, late May, we find a really special situation, which we call the kindergarten. You know, we find two or three adult long-eared owls taking care of 15 juveniles. And you know that these juveniles are not coming from one or two couples. They must be coming from more of adult birds, but you know they're putting them in the same big bush or you know more or less two or three trees and taking care of, of humans approaching and cats and dogs and so they they're kind of working well. Yeah, it's a teamwork. Okay, have you published your experiences in education with owls and owl education? And of course, you had kind of touched on this. Is it possible to get a poster of the Serbian owls in a PDF um, or in print version for that matter? Because it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, we have done loads of um, uh, publicity work here, um, uh, several uh, documentary films, um, uh, different brochures and, and smaller books and booklets and things, you know, so much has been produced, but it's never enough, as you know. Whenever you, you work with humans of different age, different 
education background, you always have to have special material for that group. For us at the moment, we believe that, uh, that uh, you know, the most um, influenced group of people should be farmers and foresters, and we should go for them straight away, trying to teach them that actually farming and forestry, uh, which is nature-based, in a way is the only way to survive on this planet because you know the influence at least in our country with uh, agriculture and forestry onto the wildlife and owls absolutely is huge and so we should go there in this direction you know as as it you know if we, if we speak about kids you know kids these days they know you know we have a and an app that we have done for uh, 260 different species of birds in the country, so not all of them, but you know, in our app, uh, which could be used for you know different types of, of mobile phones, of, of cell phones, you know, you can easily get any information. You 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 also have calls inside, so people less and less call us saying, "I saw a bird. Which bird is this?" Or you know, "I found a, an owl. What should I do?" Because we give them easy information, and and the question about um, uh, yeah, about the the poster. You know, we are not allowed to send PDF. Sorry, because of the of the of, of the copyrights for the poster. But we can think about sending printing copies to to some of you if if you would like. You know, sometimes I think this could travel for ages. But it's not up to us. You know, if you not know anyone coming to this part of Europe, maybe you know we can make it quicker, or you know we can send it to to the um, embassy in Belgrade and organize something because. You know, most of these diplomatic um, people are going to kick in there as well, watching out, so they know about the spectacle. And, you know, if you know anyone in Serbia, of course, you know, we can give some posters for um, as a present. So it seems like with this huge population of owls, there has to be a, a pretty incredible pay, uh, prey base to support them. So where do they feed? Uh, is it in the agricultural areas or the village or both? I believe they're mostly going to agriculture areas because if you walk into the agriculture areas, you, you can see rodent holes anywhere, especially like, you, you know, like last year was really good for rodents, but bad for the farmers. They were complaining about millions of wolves and, and, uh, and, and, and mice, but, uh, you know, there was trade go there. If, you, if you're standing in the middle of kicking the town square, which I forgot to say, it's the first ever uh, protected, urban protected area in Serbia, I believe, the only one in the world for the sake of the, of the owl conservation. So when you walk inside a kick in the town square, you're actually walking into the protected park and officially protected because of these species. So when you watch them departing from, uh, from the roost in the evening, which would be in January, let's say at about 5 p.m. or quarter past five, uh, they would be going in all different directions, you know, and uh, in, if, if you look at them, first thing they do is they fly out of the roost, go to the nearest treetop, and then they just rest. It's like, you know, they've kind of been um, just thinking about it. It's like, okay, let's stretch a little bit. Let's look around and think about where did they have that really cool, juicy meal last night, okay? Was it south or east? I should go east. And you can, you can see them, you know, thinking about where should I go? Because, you know, there's food all around the place, but I need to be quick. I need to be efficient. You know, why would I go and hunt for five hours when I can get my easy prey in 10 minutes? And you can see one going that direction, the other one going this direction, then five going the same direction. So, you know, they're going all around the place because the town is surrounded by agriculture area. Sometimes I, I think individual animals are having their own preferences. And they may be having this mental map of, of the region saying, you know, that's a good place. The other good thing is, you, you know, the map of the, of the whole region with all these little red dots of our roots. If you were an owl, long-eared owl coming from Scandinavia into the Balkans, uh, you know, Southeastern Europe, you fly over Serbia, there's no chance you wouldn't see another long-eared owls because they're all around the place. And I, I believe that these roots are actually step stones for migration. You're flying during the night, you see loads of owls flying down there and you say, okay, there must be food and there must be safety. So what would you need to do if you're an inexperienced owl, you just need to go look for the other owl, observe it, get your food and then get your roosting site. Just follow it. And that's simple, you know, if you come into the area where, where the density of owls is so low, the chance of finding an owl hunting and owl roost is really tiny. 
while in this area it's completely opposite and that could be also the reason why is why our numbers are big because you know it's just, it attracts all from different parts parts of europe because we have so much food but also you know these local roots may be attracting even more birds because of the activity and that could be one of the explanations as well yeah you kind of touched a little bit on it, but are long eards considered crepuscular or nocturnal? They're almost completely nocturnal. I mean, they do have some, they do have some activities um, just before the dusk is something, but they're, they're true nocturnal. And, uh, and you know, they're waiting. The, the thing is, you know, I think we need to go more, more deep into the science, let's say, and, and to study different behavior of the ones in the city in the village and in the wild, because you know why? Because you know, in the wild, it's really dark at 5 p.m. In the village, it's dark at quarter past five. But in the city, it may never get dark inside the city itself because everything is lit up. You have all the street lights, you have all the you know house lights, and and you know, in, in like in Kikin, that the whole church is lit up and the whole national museum, and you know, animals are really dependent on the on the on the quantity and the quality of light. And that could be postponing their night activity. So maybe they're going hunting from Kikinda at least half an hour later than their relatives in a nearby wild roost. So we have to figure out this as well. Um, so playing into what you were talking about, owls um, coming in from other locations, um, are there, oh, this just jumped around. Are there, um, Owl, comparable large long-eared owl roosts in Hungary or Romania nearby. Exactly, yeah. We share the same population in, in other countries, but we have big roosts, sorry. But they also have to admit, yeah, in, in Hungary, they have um, uh, quite a, a number of roosts with 100 and plus. In Romania with 100 and plus, even in, you know, we know uh, one or two big roosts in Bulgaria, but the concentration of big roosts like we have in, in this northern part of Serbia is unbelievable. You know, there, there used to be big roosts in Slovakia, in other EU countries, but, but when they entered the EU, when all the money came into the agriculture and developing, the numbers of owls just dropped. And it's really sad. Um, this is why we're now trying to do something before we actually lose these birds, to talk to farmers and try to, to tell them that, uh, that this is really important. I'll tell you another story. You know, people ask us, you know, how much rodents they eat, you know. In Vojvodina region, in winter, they eat about 30 million rodents per, you know, in just in like 120 days. So in 30 million rodents. And, and people also, you know, especially journalists, they ask us, is like, you know, but how much money they make? You know, it's like you always, you know, sometimes you have to speak about, about money and, you know, economy, ecosystem service, and put it in this way so people can easily understand. Let's say that um, on average, a long eared owl family has three chicks and they would be actually preying upon, let's say 8,000 rodents per year. You know, five or six of them if they, if they have four chicks. That means that, you know, on average, every rodent would eat at least two kilos of grain, hay, and different animal food. So a farmer could actually save 16 tons or 16,000 kilos of food for their animals on the farm if they have only one breeding pair of long-eared owls, which means that they can feed up to two really good quality cows and they can sell milk, whatever. And on average, they gain 700 euros per month, which is about $800 per month if, if you have only one breeding pair of long-eared owls. And that's not to include the amount of money you would pay for manpower to go around and put you know, poison for denticides you, you would have to spend money on rodenticides. You would kill off wildlife. You would eventually kill your dog or a cat. And these rodenticides would go inside the you know, environment, threatening your water resources, whatever. So on average, we also have a joke because you know, in Serbia, our wages are not really big. We say on average that an owl family is earning more money than a human family. And people get shocked. It's like, how is that possible? You know, but yeah, put it all combined well together. You know, and if you're a farmer having four or five pairs of long eared owls, that means that you're earning a lot. You get loads of additional help from these animals. And by saying this to, to the public, people start thinking. And these days we get more and more inquiries from, from, from farmers saying, how can I get an S box? How can, can I support my local uh, owl population? What should I do? 
and people are now following uh, different examples and that's that's really good news. And you have just talked about rodenticides. Do you have any any problems with people using um, mouse and rat poison in the in the towns especially? Yes, that's that's a huge problem. We had several cases of long-eared owls being poisoned, not in, in, intentionally, but yeah, of course, because it's a secondary poisoning. And, and we monitor all of these cases. We have different large international projects that, that do tackle uh, poisoning cases of wildlife in the country. Actually, at the moment, three of them. Uh, two of them are funding by EU funds, for especially for nature. And one is coming from, from Euronature, fund from Germany and we keep tracks and we also bring all the dead animals and all the corpses to different institutions, work with them so they can do testing and, and check it. But, you know, it's all about education. And sometimes, you know, you know, you, sometimes we also have to press charges against some people who are not uh, really following the law. It does happen. So in a way, you know, education plus the law enforcement could eventually bring change. And I do want to just mention um, someone else asked what can what can we recommend to do to educate people and a great resource for people in the US is the Raptors are the solution uh, or rats um, mm -hmm. group so you can go and check them out it's they have some cool videos and stuff. Yeah, that, that they're good we, we sometimes be using the same ideas as. Uh, as raptors as solutions because they they really good good give um, they they could give good good ideas yeah. Are there any plans to study where long eared owls travel using radio tracking? That's a good question. Okay, uh, if if anyone any volunteers are watching us uh, today, if anyone uh, is willing to come and help us with radio tracking, welcome. It, it takes a little bit of money to invest, but I think the, uh, the, the, the amount of data that you can actually get is really good. You know, the birds are here, we are here, we can organize it, so please come. Okay, uh, do you have any tips on how to find owls specifically in the tree? Um, this person has trouble uh, seeing them when they when they know there's an owl in the tree, they just can't actually see them. Okay, uh, you've seen the picture like, with, <laughs> with loads of white wash and, and, and pellets in Kikinda. I mean, first you look below the tree and then you look up. I mean, the signs of an owl presence is, is sometimes it's really obvious, it, especially if you have many birds up in the tree. You you look down, you look for the for the poo and you look for the pellets and you look straight up and there should be a bird of prey, let's say a long eared owl up in the tree. But if you have only one or two of them in the tree, that would not be so obvious. So sometimes you have to be patient, walk around a little bit. You know, the best thing in spring is just go and listen. You know, learn your five, six, seven species, you know, owls in your region calls and then go around and try to, you know, invest some time into, in, in, into finding out where they live, where they go hunting, try to help these birds never disturb them, you know, stay away from them, but you, you, you will get your chance watching them indefinitely. I'm gonna throw a question out myself. You mentioned listening for owls. Long-eared owls aren't that vocal compared to other owl species, are they? What, what time of year are they calling most? When, when can we expect to hear them? Yeah, in, in, even now, if you go to some of the roosts, young males are really full of hormones. If they, if they feed, feed well, they will stop calling now and announcing themselves to you know females around. And one of the reasons why they be they may be coming to roost is also you know there's a good um, chance that you will find your soul your your mate in, in a big group. You know this is why we humans go to bars and to you know different their concerts and whatever. You know we we're not we're not really looking for our for our soul in the middle of nowhere. But we go where the humans go. So you know owls are have a big chance to find another owl in a big group of, of owls. So they will be calling even now. But in March and April, males are really vocal. You can hear male uh, also uh, talking, well, calling to males sometimes, and the chicks are really vocal. You know people call us and also complain. It's like. I have these fluffy white things in front of my window. I didn't sleep for seven days. I have to go to work. You look at my eyes, you know, kind of. 
and we have a baby inside, you know, and the whole night you can hear, you know, they go crazy. And we say, you know, these owls, they will stop calling in really soon. And they show us a picture and they say, when we say like in three weeks time, and they go like, no, we'll kill ourselves if they if, if they go go away don't straight away. We go, like, no, please try to be patient. You know, they're just calling their mommy and daddy. You know, looking for dinner, or whatever. You, know, we can give them some food. You know, just stop. No, no, no. You know, they have to go for rodents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you know, chicks are really vocal. Then the male and the females are, you know, least vocal. Uh, are large roosts of long-eared owls common anywhere else in the world? Well, yeah, it depends on what you consider large. If you go to UK, 25 would be, whoa, you know, for us, 25 is like a, you know, like a little mistake. You know, which, when you count 500, you can easily miss 25, you know, it's like 25, it's like, yeah, yeah, one, one or half of a tree or whatever. Yeah, if you go to Eastern Europe, Southeastern Europe, a large roost would be 200 and plus, you know. If you go to Germany, a couple of dozen would be fine in Netherlands as well, you know, it depends. I, I think, you know, Eastern and Southeastern Europe has largest roost as, as far as I read. Um, I know I, I told Carla just the other day that uh, it was really funny, you know, we were just announcing how Kikin is great to our media and one day our major um, state-owned uh, TV station broadcasted a little little video of, uh, of, of two minutes showing that uh, uh, there were 16 long dolls in the center of, of Chicago and we were like why do you tell stories about 16 dolls in Chicago you know it's like I have 16 dolls you know just behind my home and and you know because thousands of people were queuing up to see them in Chicago and we were like yeah but we have 350 in, in local village so, you know, then we went into the media saying, yeah, now you think about Americans going crazy for 16 and you not going crazy for 350. So let's do something. And then we changed perspective of, of uh, local media and things went big, yeah. Do they hunt from a perch? Or do they hunt from the air? I think they do both, you know, in the evening, if you walk around, uh, you can see them standing even up on a, on a, a signpost on a, like uh, on a tree on a beside the road or on, on something, you know, on a fence, you can see that, but you can also see them quartering above the ground and hunting. I think more, more or less, most of these uh, open countryside owls, they, they hunt in a, in a similar manner, like barn owl and short eared owl and, and long eared owl. Uh, are owls protected in Serbia? Not only protected, but strictly protected. All ten species, you know, uh, you're not allowed. Um, you're not allowed to even to yell at them. You know, they're so protected that you know they're really strictly protected. And well, in reality, you know, bad things do happen like anywhere in the world. But I think more and more people are realizing that you know, protecting wildlife is is really top priority in, in the world. Um, I'm going to butcher a name here, but this one is from Tanya. She's wondering if you're collaborating with Peter Shurlinkov regarding parasites? Uh, a little bit with him, but with, uh, but especially with, with a couple of friends from Slovakia. Uh, we were helping our friend Lenka from uh, Bratislava, and she has done a really extensive good uh, PhD research on long year now. Uh, blood parasites and the data set from Serbia was was sent to her. So yeah, Shurlinkov is a is a good good friend of ours. Say hello to uh, saying hello to to, to Petr Shurlinkov. But but this time we were we were uh, working with uh, with our Slovakian friends. Uh, have any of the townspeople considered setting up webcams so people around the world can watch the long-eared owls? Yeah. Um, that was the idea. We, we still didn't do that, but if, I was talking to someone um, ages ago and, and someone said, okay, putting up webcams, but not much is going on. You know, if owls are not disturbed, then we were just sitting there for the whole day and doing this. And not, not much, you know, because 
some of the really, really, you know, dedicated people would go and watch on this webcam, you know, but the other people would readily go and watch a lion's attacking a baby elephant in, in savannah or something, you know, that, you know, so people are watching webcams if there's movement, is there something going on on regular basis, you know, but, but an owl sitting up in a tree and doing nothing is just, I, I think it's not really, it's not going really to work yet. I would like to point out that we have a lot of people who watch our cams when there's nothing going on. And the Owl Research Institute does indeed have a long-eared owl roost cam and people do watch it. Really? Their, their roosts in Montana are way smaller than your roosts are. Okay, then let's go for one in Kikinda. Um, and somebody asked if the universities are involved with the long-eared owls. Yes. As I said, our friend Dimitri Radisic, uh, he's now teaching professor at uh, Novi Sad University. His, um, his, one, of, uh, one of his previous theses was uh, on long yard owl winterers. So he's engaged and a couple other friends as well. When you're counting, um, do they fly around? And if so, how do you know you haven't already counted an owl? Well, the bad news is if you flush owls from the roost, that's already bad, you know. So, so most of the time they wouldn't be flushed. Owls are just sitting up there. You go from a tree to a tree. You most of the time you have to walk around to have different angles. Um, you know, if you come to a tree uh, which is really dense, let's say that would be a civil spruce or something, and and you you watch it and you say, well, one, two, three, four, five. Let's go way up. I have only five. It that usually means it's. 50 inside, you know, because you have to go around, you have you to what to, you know to look really carefully so you can see every single individual. And then you go from a tree to a tree. Sometimes we we have maps with um, position of different trees and their little um, places so you can put numbers in, or you you know, and then you can go from tree to tree and just um, have exact numbers. You know. Does Kikinda still hold that annual owl festival, the Sovember? I love the name of that. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is. It is. I, I believe next November would be in full capacity because the, the previous one was, you know, has had, had to be canceled uh, because of the, of the current uh, COVID-19 thing. But the next one would be in full capacity. So please come and enjoy it. And are there any other owls that... Uh, do this kind of communal roosting, um, so many others in the same tree? Yeah, um, we do have short-eared owls coming to our grasslands in, in sometimes in big numbers, in several dozen, maybe even over a hundred. And But they would be mostly sitting up on the, in a rough grassland on the ground, sometimes in, in low bushes. Uh, the funny thing is in Scandinavia, I think in, in Sweden, even uh, eagle owls have started to roost together. And it was found just by chance, uh, maybe 10 years ago, when one of the juvenile eagle owls was tracked with, with a tag within uh, Scandinavia. It was coming, I think, from, uh, from Norway to Sweden and opposite, whatever. And then they found this individual with a group of an another uh, non-related uh, uh, eagle owls, and which was even more funny, you know, just at the outskirts of, of a city. So uh, the strategy, strategy with some species is to go together, while the other ones, they, you know, you would never see, um, I don't know, a Tony owl in, in a group of 50 or a Ural owl. They, they cannot stand each other really close if they're not within the, their family group. So, so, you know, most of the owls would be, would be far away. Well, we actually had an interesting sighting a couple of years ago in, uh, uh, in the town just near us where there's usually a, a, a roost a roost, which is like five or six <laughs> uh, of long-eared owls, and someone saw a barn owl sitting in the roost with them. So that was very interesting. We had we had three such cases in this country as well, and they were shocked. It's like, what is this guy doing up there? Uh, yeah, wrong tree, wrong, wrong place. Yeah. So it did happen. So we had once a single tawny owl, but next to the roost, we had three times barn owls within the roost, and many times short-eared owls coming into the long-eared owls. But the long-eared owl and short-eared owls are, you know, well, quite related in a way, but the barn owl, as you said, is like, wow. 
We have two related questions. Um, do you know how far away they're foraging from the roost sites and what is their typical home range? Okay, uh, we couldn't calculate this because we couldn't, we didn't track them in the, so precisely, but from different studies from countries around Serbia, there on average, the home range would be a couple of square kilometers, let's say, uh, that would be maybe up to 10 square kilometers. And, and they would be hunting to up to several kilometers or let's say several miles from the place where they breed the roost, which means, you know, they're going to different directions. And but the, the, the question is for that I question myself, if an owl is, you know, if an owl wakes up in the evening, you know, by spending a day in a roost, number one, goes hunting, does it go all of them, do they go to the same roost back again in the morning or during the night, or do they go to another, another roost? That's a question, you know, because you come in the, in the morning and there's so many of them, you count 250. You come to next morning, you, you count 252, let's say. And you think, you know, the numbers are quite the same, but are those the same birds on Monday or on Tuesday? Are they swap locations? We don't know that because you, then you will have to track and catch so many of them and track all their movements so you can say, you know, percentage of birds coming to the same place. We know that certain individuals, as, as I said, come to the same tree, same branch, same piece of branch, but do they all come to the same place? We don't know. Can you speak to the genetic diversity of the long-eared owl population in Serbia? Uh, is there evidence of some long-eared from neighboring countries breeding with the Serbian population? We don't have such data. I mean, some of the blood samples are just waiting there to be tested, and uh, we don't have enough enough time, and enough resources to do that. You know, if if there's an international team that wants to help, please come and join. With the warming climate in Serbia, is there any indication that the range of the longyears is extending into higher altitudes and regions that are more mountainous? Hmm. Um, a famous ornithologist, Sergei Matveyev, some, let's say, eight years ago, stated that the long owl was actually living mostly in mountains. And, well, that may be because he was researching birds most in the mountains, not really in the lowlands. That could be the reason. So he said it's a mountainous owl species. We do find them breeding from, from 2,000 meters above sea level down to 30 meters above sea level in negative, whatever. So there's a huge range. You can, you can find really old pairs up in the mountains in almost alp, alp, uh, you know, alpine climate like uh, conifer forests at the edge of the forest with little, little clearings and down to you know, city centers. So we don't have such observations. Uh, we believe that you know, most of the population is simply down in, in agriculture areas because the food is there, because the crows are there, and the hooded crow and the magpie and the rook, and those are the species that actually predominantly bring, uh, you know, build a nest for the, for the long eared owl. So they, I think they're more or less uh, following our human presence as we clear up the forest, as we open the habitat and we actually support them with, with food. Somebody wants to see your t-shirt and find out what, what it means. Okay, there's a t-shirt, which means ja, which means I in Serbian. Of course, there's a, there's a heart, love, kikinda. So there are three symbols in kikinda. Well, the owl is, 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 the, is the major one, we have to admit. Uh, so three major symbols, you've seen the mammoth. That was the previous symbol. Then this is combined pumpkin with a long year owl. They also have a huge pumpkin festival in Kikinda in September or beginning, beginning of August. And there's a competition in cooking different pumpkin dishes and having heaviest pumpkin in the world and longest pumpkin in the world, whatever. And it's quite a funny thing and there's plenty of local dancing and music and, and people coming from all over the Europe and world. But you know, the owls are actually beating the other two symbols, sorry. Does Wings or other ornithology travel companies offer your tours or field trips? Um, and this person asked, if I come, can I have a guide for other owls too? 
Yes, yes, we can organize that. Um, there are a couple of British companies offering. David Linda, for example, you can look at the Urban Birder uh, website. He's offering tours and we can organize uh, tours for uh, uh, tailor-made groups whenever you want. And the other species which could be easily offered are, uh, you know, Scopsal, and Little Owl, and Barn Owl, and Ural Owl, even in the Eagle Owl sometimes. But if somebody has enough time, uh, it could be also organized uh, going up into the mountains and maybe getting all of the 10 species that we have in the country. That means getting tang moles and pygmy owl as well. And just, just, just to mention, you know, David Linda has a good saying, you know, uh, when people come uh, during the winter tour in Serbia, he says, if you don't see your towels and long eared owls, I will eat my binoculars. And you know, in three days you have to you have to get your one thousand. That's that's clear. That's simple. And as as Carla said at, at, at the beginning of this presentation, my personal record was 25, 2,500 a day. Of course, together with my friends, we were going from a village to another town to another village, counting them. And it's, so it's for twenty five hundred long year dolls in just one single day. Are there any other species of owls that use a, a daycare arrangement for caring for their young? Um, and, it, and if these daycares are observed during the day, what might the absent adults be doing? I don't, I'm not, I don't know about the other species. You know, we, we know that this kindergarten thing we observe with, with a long-eared owl on, on this one spot, and that could mean that they're doing it readily on different spots as well. But for the other species, you know, we don't know other species nesting in such huge densities so close to each other as the long eared owl do. So that could be the reason why we don't observe other species. You know, little owls, they could have big densities in a, in a village or a town, but you wouldn't see breeding pairs, you know, so close to each other and, and, and sharing their, their space while, while this species has no problem. <clears throat> I'm gonna try some more Serbian presentation or uh, uh, pronunciation. A question from Tanya, does uh, Sremska Mitrovica still have communal roosts during the summer? Uh, during the summer? Well, yeah, well, there, there's a big roost in Sremska Mitrovica. Our friend Marko Cvianovic is, has even organized a nice uh, events there and he has posted, uh, actually placed um, silhouettes uh, on different windows of public buildings because some of the birds were flying into the windows. So he, he, he is now doing a good job to prevent this. And, but I, I don't know whether they're, they've been there during the summer. I think they, they come there just like in any other place from let's say beginning of fall, beginning of autumn until, until the winter. Uh, someone would like to know what your email address is if they have other questions. Oh gosh. <clears throat> okay. Um, can we type it down or something? Is it is it easier? Because. Yep. So uh, you can you can actually put it in the chat. I'll just um, do it in a second. Yep. Yes. If you just hit all panelists and attendees, then it'll give it to everybody. I mean, I can spell, but it would it would take ages, you know, to, to write down. So this is much easier. Um, say this, we've covered it, but somebody asked if you could say again the name of your colleague who was doing the pellet studies on long-eared owls. Well, it was Tanya Jovanovic, and, but also other people as well. Tanya is living in the States. She's a, a, a teacher. She's teaching kids uh, biology in the States, and uh, she has done a huge study here after Tanya, uh, several other people has, have done, but not in, in such a big scale. All right, here's more of an opinion question. What do you think the, the top three or five benefits to humans uh, of having the owls in your city? 
Well, depends on yeah on what you consider a benefit. You know, for me, benefit is a beauty. You know, itself, not only the value of money or something. Well, having goals in your city means that you're probably still living in a healthy environment, because you know raptors are so sensitive to any huge change in the environment. They're far less. Um, uh, they have far a shorter life than we humans and they can easily um, uh, get all the different pollutants from the environment and you can actually track them down and see, you know, if, if something bad is going on. They, of course, they, they eat rodents and they help our economy, they help our, our farming. Um, they're incredibly powerful tool for education. You know, these days, I think, Kids in Europe, they, they much more know about African wildlife than European wildlife because, you know, programs are just giving you Africa's top five, top 10 lions, whatever, and eventually tigers and things. But, you know, you don't know anything about how sparrows and hooded crows and things that actually live just in front of your, your nose outside, out there. And, uh, and, and when you talk to people who never observed owls in the wild, they would say, well, owls are living in the wild some place away from me then you open their eyes and saying you know the animals are here and we share the same environment you know they may be they may be sharing your garage or your your train just in front of your 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 bedroom whatever so that's that's really uh, that's really important to also to show people appreciation of wildlife within the urban environment and that could attract them to start studying the, the, the wildlife and, and, and trying to help them. And they, then they open their views and they, they, then they get inter, uh, you know, inter, interested for woodlands and for you know, different kinds of habitats. So you know, that could be all different, different ranges of actually service that a, a live owl uh, is actually doing to us. And not to mention hundreds of them sitting up in trees. And then of course, you know, it brings people attention to, to your place, to your village, to your town. If, if, if new, for example, you know, in around the world, you would pay more for a house or for a flat, whatever, if you have some nice wildlife, a nice view close. Uh, while in Serbia, you know, we still didn't get to this point, but, you know, people would be, would, they should be saying, you know, I'm living in the street with the uh, owl roost and my house is 25% more expensive now than it used to be 10 years ago because this is a special feature you know and if you want to live there you know you're having your personal roost in this in this village and i want to be close to it i'll, I'll buy this house and this yard and you know so this could also raise profile of the of the species and, the, and of the environment surrounding of the roost as well Um, you had this kind of plays off the urban and where you're living um, that apartment building that you were talking about expanding and they cut some trees down where they did they replant the trees after they're cut down or are they just gone. Yeah, on, on some of the sites where they cut the trees down they didn't replace them and that, that's bad. Um, in the north, north of Serbia, uh, there are no naturally growing conifer trees so they all planted whatever you see in this in this this area. If it's a conifer tree, it's been planted because simply, you know, the, the the area is not suitable for conifer trees. They don't naturally grow there. So sometimes people call and say, you know, what should we be doing uh, to support the local owls? And, and we would say plant pines and then spruce and other species. Yeah, of course, you have to wait a couple of decades for them to grow up well, so they can they could actually attract owls. But you know, the best time to plant trees is. 30 years ago and the next best, best time is today. So don't wait. And uh, and if we get any inquiries from local governments, local you know, city councils, whatever, we would also tell them to uh, follow the example. It's like, okay, if, you, if you're putting ornamental, or, ornamental trees and green spaces uh, designing within your area, please consider having these species of trees that could actually encourage uh, our populations. And are any of the farmers in your area um, putting up owl boxes to encourage uh, the long ears to hunt in their fields? Absolutely, yeah, and more and more. 
And not only that, the people people also put uh, different poles in the middle of the field to encourage buzzards and other species coming to, and, and owls, of course, during the night to, to, to prey upon upon uh, upon rodents. And you know, more we talk about this, more people would would be joining. And uh, as as I said, we need to work with farmers far more these days because there are many great people out there. There are many smart people out there, but they were never thinking about this as a way to uh, of farming. So it needs time and space. You know, while being in, in Western Europe, in the States, the programs like this have, were developed for, for ages, for decades. You know, we're still lagging behind the whole concept. And, and so it's up to us now, to our society, our friends, our members and volunteers and the wide public to influence the, the way how farmers, especially farmers and enforcers think and, and work. Uh, Jeff Marks has a comment. He studies long-eared owls here in the US. Um, so he said, in nesting concentrations of long-eared owls that he has studied in the U.S., ranchers could get mixed together at night, but the parents found their own young by their food-begging vocalizations and fed them preferentially. That is, he couldn't find evidence that adult fe adults fed young that were not their own. Small sample size, but interesting nonetheless. Oh, that, that's really good to know, yeah. Although to us, all the juveniles, you know, sound more or less the same. But of course, mom and dad know the best. You have to work on your ear on so you can tell them apart. Work on that. Um, and I'm going to throw out a question because I'm curious. How? What's the population of Kikinda, human-wise, not owl-wise? What's the human population? Uh, about about thirty-five thousand to forty-five thousand people, I think. So every human in in well, every owl in Kikinda has hundred humans as neighbors. So let's say one to 100 is a, is a ratio on average. While the population of humans in Kikinda is, is declining because, you know, the, the local economy is, was not doing really good after the 1990s. It's starting to recover recently. But, you know, people are, you know, especially young people, they're going to bigger towns and outside of the country because looking for better jobs, you know, uh, easier future. And so uh, as a joke, you know, one day we could end up with one to one ratio and kick into you, know, you never know. We're actually getting through most of our questions. Um, someone does want to know if you can do their calls again, please. And they said, please. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'll just do a mail because, you know, um, I didn't drink enough water. I was talking too much. Okay, so I'll just hoot a little bit of a mail and that would be enough for, for me for tonight. So it's really simple hoot and you can do it yourself. Trust me. It's like, mm. Mm. nothing special. Yeah. I have to say at our owl festival, we do a kid's owl calling contest every year and the kids have to say what species they're going to imitate and then do the call and the judges don't get to look at the kids. And one year we had a boy who was about four years old who um, stood up front and he just did who. Who. <laughs> and counted four seconds on his finger. Who. He was one of the top winners. So if a four year old can do it, anybody can do it. Right. Absolutely. Um, another question, what's the advantage of communal roosting? Safety. Because, you know, if, you, if, if you're in a group, you can, there, there are more pairs of, pair of eyes and, and ears, and you can, you can get a, a stone marten climbing up a tree or a ghost oak or something. Uh, the chance of finding your, your mate, your soul, is, is much bigger in a group than, uh, than outside of the group. If you're an uh, unexperienced uh, um, individual, you can track other individuals and, and find places with plenty of food, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I believe these, these are the top three. Um, someone wants to ask about double clutching or, or breeding more than once a year. Um, have you seen that? And what would be the reason for that? Uh, they specifically ask, is it because of abundance of food or of mortality of the first brood? 
abundance of food. You know, it, it, it did happen, I, I think, three or four years ago. Clearly, we had uh, double brooding early in the spring and then late in the summer and so much food around that they don't, you know, because it's much easier to observe a common kestrel because they breed in the same area and they may be hunting for the same food, which is the rodents. You know, some of the rodents are hunted by owls during the night and of course by kestrels during the day. And you can see kestrels going out of the of the nest for a rodent and coming in like in two minutes with a rodent and coming into the nest. So, you know, so the, the food is so abundant that nobody has trouble to find it. And then you have full clutch of, of owls in the spring and then August and September, another clutch of, of the same pair of owls. So, you know, so much food around. Um, somebody is wondering if you have plans available for the long-eared owl nest boxes that you've been using. Good. Uh, we actually steal uh, plans from the RSPB, from the Royal Society of Protection of Birds. And we use the ones that are meant uh, to be for the common kestrel. So you just type common kestrel, nest box, RSPB design, and you easily get it. I think it's um, 30 times 30 centimeters times 45 centimeter, centimeters in depth. That's a really simple box. And, and, uh, and the front is semi-opened and open and then uh, down onto the, um, uh, onto the bottom, bottom you can put gravel, you can put sand or something just you know, to encourage a little bit. Sometimes we do put hay or some other material, but material, but I, I believe sand and gravel will, will be just fine. And they take it easily without a problem. Although we all think about um, a long year doll mostly breeding in a, in a naturally made crow nest or something else there in the wild. But you know, this, for example, we had a case in, in Little Sunday in the park, and that, that's a good thing. Um, yeah, exactly. This is the best. Um, so they went inside one of these boxes in early March, and they uh, their chicks fledged at the already at the, let's say beginning of May or something, they were out. Then the, the pair of common kestrels went, went, let's say, and laid eggs late May, they fledged, and then the same pair of long eared owls went, went into the same box late in the, in, the, in, the, in the summer. So we had three clutches in one nest box in just one season. Yep. Um, I think we're about at time here. We've got just about everything covered. Um, Jeff Marks did say that um, uh, they found that, although it's almost impossible for humans to tell the begging calls apart, that spectrographically, um, usually you can see the difference. So obviously mom and dad can tell the difference in who the kids are. Um, we have posted in chat, if you wanna support um, Milan's work and the work of BirdLife Serbia, um, there's not a direct donation link, but if I'm correct, Milan, they can use that email address that's listed in the chat. Yes, yes. Um, and PayPal. Uh, to make a PayPal donation. Yeah, yeah. And the question on probably several people's minds about if they want to come to Serbia, um, do they need to do that through a bird tour company or are there other ways to come and see the long-eared owls? Can people just come and see them? Yeah, I would I would encourage anyone to to send me an email and then we can discuss. You know, it depends on you know maybe you would come to this part of, of Europe and just want to spend one or two days for something special, or if you want to go for a full tour or whatever, you know what we can we can all discuss. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much for doing this. This has been fascinating, entertaining, fun, and just great. And it's getting late for you over there. It's ten p.m. Yes. Oh, no. Well, I'm, I'm a night owl. Oh, well, so then counting owls during the day, you up then, huh? <laughs> yeah. So thank you again to everybody who's participating in our Virtual Owl Expert Speaker Series. Um, I mean, we wouldn't be doing it if people weren't interested. So it's great to see so many people interested from literally all over the world and all over North America, especially. And we're extremely grateful to all of our speakers who are sharing their knowledge and experience with us, which is just a fascinating opportunity for all of us. Um, and I wanna invite you to next week's presentation, which is gonna be Mahdi Charter from Israel. He'll be talking about his work with barn owls. Um, and actually, 
back in 2000, spe speaking of meeting people at OWL conferences, back in 2007, Mari Milan and I spent an afternoon in the Netherlands, <laughs> skipping out on the Dutch OWL day because we didn't understand Dutch at the time. <laughs> so anyway, um, Mari will be up next week. Um, and yeah, we hope you join us. And Milan's inbox is going to be swamped with emails, I think, after this. So thank you again, Milan. Have a wonderful night and we'll be in touch. Thank you guys for inviting me. This was real fun. Goodbye, Terry. Keep safe and, and enjoy, enjoy owls and nature. <laughs>